Hello, everybody. This is Rich Poland speaking to you from uh, New York City at Columbia University. And today I'm going to be speaking about one of my favorite topics in neonatology, and that is early on sepsis. Uh, and I want to bring you greetings from my hospital, which is called the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital of New York. It's the largest freestanding um, children's hospital in New York City. We have a NICU that has an average census of about um, 85 babies. And we have the only NICU that I'm aware of that has a specialized unit for neonates with congenital heart disease. I think we're known for many things, but one is that we have some of the best looking uh, doctors and nurses. And I think if you look at them, it may look familiar to you, but you have to admit it's a very good looking bunch. Sepsis is a worldwide problem, and these are data, both adult and pediatric data, from a review article by Rudd et al. that was published last year, looking at mortality around the world. And the top upper graph is, looks at various countries, uh, and looks at the incidence of sepsis per 100,000, and the bottom graph is percentage of all deaths related to sepsis and you see the darker colors uh, on the screen, a lot of South America, Central America, Sub-Saharan Africa, certainly parts of Asia, and perhaps part of the Middle East where the incidence of sepsis is highest, again, this is adult and pediatric data, and the percentage of all deaths related to sepsis follow a similar pattern. This is from the same article and looks at three causes of sepsis, uh, or three causes of death in various uh, aged individuals. The red is infection. I'd like you to look at it. It's sort of a, has two peaks, a peak of sepsis related mortality early on. And that we know that because babies are most susceptible to sepsis right at the beginning of life. And then a second peak in elderly individuals. When I was a fellow back in the 1970s, taking care of babies with sepsis, we would say is a no-brainer. I'm not sure that translates into other languages, but it was pretty simple. A baby was admitted with sepsis. We took a blood culture, got a CBC, and started the baby on antibiotics. And back in the 1970s, those antibiotics were penicillin and catamycin, and we treated babies for about five days. And just about every baby did well. Now, we did know about um, the adverse effects of aminoglycosides, both ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. But we never dreamed that some antibiotics would actually increase mortality, has been shown uh, in infants who receive routinely third generation cephalosporins. And this concept of dysbiosis, a change in the microbes in the body, leading to bronchopulmonary dysplasia, necrotizing enterocolitis, and late on sepsis. And uh, that's the reason we want to try to limit uh, the use of antibiotics in the early neonatal period. The consequences of using antibiotics indiscriminately obviously leads to prolonged hospitalizations. It separates mothers and babies, therefore interferes with breastfeeding and certainly bonding. It can lead to unnecessary procedures, especially IV infiltration is a common risk. And we see probably one baby in my NICU every month or every couple months. It has a, a significant IV infiltration and it leads to increased expenses. This is uh, an article, data from an article published in 2014, so about seven years ago, in which they concluded that the cost to prevent one death by admitting and treating every infant exposed to core immunized for 48 hours would be over $10 million. And these are just US data. And you're gonna hear me say that core immunized, especially for late preterm and term babies, should not be an automatic admit or automatic treatment, but in many hospitals, it still is. And the uh, worldwide costs are in the hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars. Let me share with you some numbers. First of all, although we think of sepsis pretty commonly, it's an uncommon disease with an incidence of about a half to one per thousand live births. If you take the population of late preterm and term babies, if the baby is asymptomatic and well appearing, 
the risk can be as low as 25,000. That's the reason in that population, if a baby looks well, we tend not to do any further workup. Sepsis workups are, are far more common in babies with who truly have bacteremia, but most babies are for infants who have clinical signs, but have truly have non-infectious uh, diseases. The numbers for um, preterm babies are more ominous. First of all, three quarters of all deaths from early onset sepsis are in the VLBW babies, so weigh less than 1,500 grams. Just about 90% of VLBWs receive broad spectrum antibiotics for possible sepsis. And prolonged treatment, more than five days, is, is common in the ELBW, ELBW population. The reason we worry about prolonged treatment or more than five days is because of the associated risks of mortality, BPD, late onset sepsis, and necrotizing enterocolitis. So the question as posed in my first slide is how do we identify the infant with clinical signs or risk factors who's actually infected? And for us, we would say that's like finding a needle in a haystack. Or the corollary to that is, can we safely decrease antibiotic exposure in newborn infants who perhaps are at lower risk for sepsis? And the opportunities to decrease antibiotic exposure are twofold. First of all, there's healthy appearing babies, late preterm and term babies, with any risk factor infection, and that includes core amniotis or intraamniotic infection. And the second population, who we probably should not treat with antibiotics, are preterm babies with no risk factors for infection, who are born by elective cesarean section uh, or with ruptured membranes uh, at the time of delivery. And that population is also um, at very low risk for infection. Now, the two strategies which have been used to, to decide which babies need antibiotics are use of the sepsis calculator uh, with zero observations, so we don't use one without the other, or zero observations alone without any laboratory testing. Now, as we practice in the NICU, we all like scientific evidence and try to practice in an evidence-based format, but we don't always have the evidence we would like to have. And it's a famous saying by this individual, Carl Sagan, who was an astrophysicist who died a few years ago. He said, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So just because we don't have the evidence for every aspect of treatment of sepsis does not mean it's true. And I like to say less eloquently than Dr. Sagan, evidence is, is not all it's cracked up to be. Babies can get infected through, through four different pathways. The two infrequent uh, pathways are retrograde infection from the mother's abdominal cavity or infection introduced at the time of amniocentesis. Again, both are quite rare. The two more common pathways are hematogenous dissemination through the placenta, and that's how the so-called torch infections are dissemination of the fetus, or ascending infections from the mother's birth canal into the amniotic cavity causing a choriaminitis or intraamniotic infection. And we know that the establishment of an intraamniotic infection is a key step in the pathway of sepsis. So the risk of sepsis in babies born to mothers who have an intraamniotic infection is dependent on gestational age. If we look at our late preterm and term population in babies born to women who have clinical intraamniotic infection, still sepsis is quite rare, probably 1% or less. On the other hand, if we start to look at a more immature population of babies born to women with choriaminitis or intraamniotic infection, the risk of sepsis is significantly higher. So these are data from the NICHD Neonatal Research Network, looking at babies 22 through 28 weeks gestation, and the three outcomes are histologic choreoaminitis, clinical choreoaminitis, and early onset sepsis. So if you look at babies born at the margins of viability, clinical choreoaminitis is seen in about a quarter of those mothers, and about one-fourth of women with clinical choreoaminitis will deliver babies with early onset sepsis. That's quite dramatic. If you look at the other extreme of the slide, in the incidence of clinical choreoaminitis, at 28 weeks is only 14%, and only one out of 14 babies will develop early onset bacteremia. 
So the greater the degree of prematurity, the greater the risk of early onset sepsis. And the other interesting thing from the slide is that lots of women have histologic chorimeitis. Relatively few women have clinical chorimeitis. It tells you that when the pathology report comes back, it says there's inflammation there. It does not mean that it's a pathogen which can cause infection to the baby. The definition of chorimeitis or intraamniotic infection, which is the new term, is important because it determines how we manage babies. And there's been a lot of international and national guidelines. I was part of the guidelines in the US, both those from the CDC and Committee of Fetus and Newborn. And the guidelines in 2010, 2011 looked a lot like this. If you have a mother who has suspected chorimeitis, get a blood culture test, get, try to get laboratory testing at six to 12 hours of life, but even if the baby looks well, asymptomatic, begin broad spectrum antibiotics. And I made those, in fact, I was the primary author on the publications from the AP. And for that, I'm ashamed because those are the wrong recommendations. And I'll talk about new recommendations in just a moment. What were the consequences from the CDC guidelines, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and even the NICE guidelines from the UK, led to a lot of unnecessary workups for sepsis, prolonged antibiotic therapy solely based on abnormal laboratory values and increased length of stay for those babies, unnecessary costs, obviously, and invasive procedures, especially when the NICE guidelines were followed. So the question is, can we diagnose an intraamniotic infection in the mother or core amniotis with better position, precision? And there's four ways of, de of defining infection prior to birth. We, as clinicians, we rely upon maternal signs of choriamnionitis or intraamniotic infection, such as maternal fever, tachycardia in the mother, fetal tachycardia, uterine tenderness, leukocytosis in the mom, or foul-smelling vaginal discharge. I've already talked a little bit about histologic choreo, but it usually it doesn't enter into our decision-making because we don't know what the placenta is showing. I remember histologic chorioamnionitis or intraamniotic infection is three times as common as clinical chorioamnionitis in the mother. There are uh, measurements that can be done on amniotic fluid, such as looking for elevated cytokines, not routinely done. And also not routinely done is taking a sample of the amniotic fluid and doing a culture or looking for PCR. All four of these are correlated with infection, but the one we rely upon most is uh, maternal signs of intraamniotic infection. The old criteria developed in the early 1990s for clinical chorioamnionitis include a maternal temperature of at least 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, which translates into 38 degrees centigrade, plus at least two of the other findings on this list maternal tachycardia, fetal tachycardia, an elevated maternal white count, more than 15,000, uterine tenderness or foul-smelling amniotic fluid. And the problem with this is that many obstetricians looked at just one thing. They looked at the maternal temperature and said, oh yes, this is a case of intraamniotic infection. Because of that, I organized a workshop at the NIH, which was held in 2015, and we came up with a new definition called triple I. Triple I stands for intrauterine inflammation and or infection. And the whole purpose of this was to distinguish women who just had a fever, perhaps from an epidural, who actually had a true chorioamnionitis or intraamnionic infection. And we identified three categories, isolated fever, which really was not choreo, or suspected triple I, or definite triple I. And I won't go into the exact definitions except for isolated fever, which is just a fever greater than 38 degrees uh, centigrade. But we, the hope was, was that it would decrease the number of babies who have sepsis workups because a suspicion of maternal infection. Well, you got criticized because of triple I, but two years later, ACOG took almost our exact definition for intraamniotic infection. So they had a category of isolated maternal fever, 
which is a fever of 38 to 39, a category of suspected intraamniotic infection, which includes a fever greater than 39 or 38 to 39 plus some additional risk factor, such as a high maternal weight count or purulent cervical drainage or fetal tachycardia. And then there's a category of confirmed triple based on tests done on amniotic fluid. Let me present you a case. This is a case of baby Kim, who was delivered at 37 and 2 7 weeks gestation. So it was an early term gestation, following rupture of membranes for 26 others, 26 hours, excuse me. The mother was culture positive for group Bishopteococcus, a common neonatal pathogen, and received broad spectrum antibiotics, but just two and a half hours prior to delivery for a temperature of 38. The baby was suctioned and dried by the nurse, placed on CPAP. APGAR scores were pretty good. The respiratory distress went away. CPAP was discontinued. And you see on the slide, this is what baby Kim looked like. And it was obviously a very intelligent looking baby. So how would you manage this infant? You have some choices. And I'm only giving you three choices. And I want you, at least in your mind, to pick what you select. Supportive care, no antibiotics testing or cultures a blood culture and broad spectrum antibiotics, or screening tests or blood culture. And for me, there is only one choice which is correct, supportive care and no antibiotics, testing or cultures. Those of you who follow the old guidelines written by NICE or CDC or the Academy of Pediatrics might choose this, but I think it's outdated, and I hope nobody's doing screening laboratory studies. So when I get a, a baby admitted and they're worried about sepsis, I ask two questions. Is the baby symptomatic or asymptomatic? And is the baby of any risk factors for sepsis or not? So if a baby is admitted to our NICU and they're critically ill and symptomatic, well, again, I use the phrase no brainer. We're gonna treat a baby who's critically ill no matter what the risk factors are. On the other hand, if the baby is well appearing, but there's still risk factors for sepsis, I think you have some choices. If it's not chorioaminitis and it's not a premature baby, you might just observe the baby. On the other hand, you might want to do some diagnostic testing. And if it's a premature baby and there's maternal suspicion of an intraamniotic infection, you're going to treat that baby with antibiotics. But there's a third category, and the third category are babies who are symptomatic, but there's no risk factors for sepsis the baby who might be a little bit lethargic or a little bit tachypneic at birth. And what I do is observe those babies for four to six hours and see if they're getting better. Hopefully it's just a slow transition in many of those babies. But if they're not getting better or if they're getting worse, then I might do some diagnostic testing. If there's any suspicion of, um, of sepsis based on clinical signs or diagnostic testing, we're gonna treat that baby with antibiotics. If the diagnostic testing is normal and the baby's getting better, then we do not treat that baby. So this is what you see in most textbooks as the risk factors for sepsis. On the left are listed the conditions. On the right is incidence of proven sepsis. So if there's just prolonged rupture of membranes for more than 18 hours, the risk of sepsis in the baby is about 1%. If there are combinations of risk factors, shown at the bottom, such as prolonged rupture of membranes and prematurity, the risk of sepsis is four to 6% or, um, excuse me, or if it's prolonged rupture of membranes and low APGAR score, the risk can be three to 4%. So risk factors are additive. I want you to look at this one category here, positive colonization with GBS and maternal chorioaminitis, where the risk in some studies was as high as 20%. And that's the reason the old CDC AAP guidelines said all infants born to mothers with core immunitis need treatment. What we didn't realize when we wrote the guidelines is that these were all symptomatic babies with this high risk of sepsis. And in asymptomatic babies, the risk is much lower. So it was this study in 2011, I can't believe it's 10 years old now, which changed how we approach babies. This is a study by Gabriel Escobar and Karen Popolo. Uh, Dr. Escobar is from the West Coast. Dr. Popolo is from uh, University of Pennsylvania. It was a nested case control study of babies who were at least 34 weeks of station. 
Uh, the cases included 350 babies who had positive blood cultures, and uh, the controls were about three times the number of controls. And what made this study different is instead of using a cutoff value, such as prolonged rupture membrane for 18 hours or maternal fever 38, all risk factors were treated as continuous variables. Interestingly, in the population, ne nearly a third of the infants with positive blood cultures were asymptomatic in the first 12 hours of life, but then became symptomatic. This is what the data looked like. And we're looking at a graph, the rate of sepsis according to gestational age, just to orient you, it, on the y-axis are cases per thousand live births. The dotted line or dashed line indicates the background risk of sepsis in the population, which is about 0.5 per thousand live births. The actual data in babies 34 to 42 weeks is shown by the black line, the smoothed out data by the red line. But the lowest risk of sepsis um, is that term gestation, 38 weeks, it remains low. Post-term babies have a higher risk of sepsis and those born prematurely have, again, a high risk of sepsis, not surprisingly. And these are the data according to duration of ruptured membranes. Again, the dotted line is the background risk of sepsis in the population. And I said that 18 hours used to be the standard for prolonged ruptured membranes, but even at lesser durations of ruptured membranes, the risk of sepsis goes up even at 10 to 12 hours, and a longer duration of ruptured membranes, the risk goes up even higher. And this is the risk of sepsis according to highest maternal temperature. I said 100.4 is significant, but the higher the degree of maternal temperature, the greater the risk of earliness of sepsis. And again, the dotted line is the background risk of sepsis in the population. So what Dr. Popolo and Dr. Escobar did is they created an algorithm based on these six risk factors. The gestational age of the baby in weeks and days, the highest maternal temperature, duration of rupture membranes, the mother's status for group streptococcus, was it positive, negative, or uncertain? The uh, maternal treatment, was it GBS specific or broad spectrum like ampicillin and genomycin? And was it given at least four hours prior to delivery? And if we take our case of baby Kim I showed you sooner, these are the numbers I took away. It was a late term delivery. Mother had a, a low grade maternal fever, Membranes were for, for 26 hours. She was positive for group streptococcus and given ampicillin and genomycin. Uh, and antibiotics were given 2.0 to 3.9 hours prior to delivery. The risk of sepsis, according to the sepsis calculator, was 1.61 per thousand live births. If in your population, the risk of background risk is about 0.5, you say, well, that's a baby about three times the risk of sepsis. This is a baby I, I want to observe quickly or more closely and get some laboratory studies on. Well, Dr. Escobar and Dr. Popolo went on and said, okay, we know about the risk of sepsis with, when we have maternal risk factors. Can we now incorporate the baby's clinical signs? And they went and looked at the same babies in the same population and said some babies are, um, are well-appearing some babies have, are mildly ill, have an equivocal presentation, or some babies are dramatically ill. And they did what is a form of Bayesian analysis. They took the pretest probability of sepsis based on historical data I just showed you. They then looked at the baby's clinical presentation, again, well-appearing, equivocal, or sick, and they came up with a new risk of sepsis, which they called posterior probability. So taking the same risk factors from baby Kim, if the baby was well appearing with the same risk factors, the risk of sepsis would actually only be 0.66 per thousand live births. And that's a baby would be admitted to the well newborn nursery and do nothing else. On the other hand, if the baby were symptomatic and they define symptomatic or equivocal presentation very precisely, uh, the risk of sepsis goes up to eight. And that's a baby you probably want to give antibiotics and get a blood culture from. And then if the baby were really sick, the risk of sepsis in the same baby with the same historical risk factors would go up to 33. Again, treatment with antibiotics would be appropriate. You can find, I'm sure you know the sepsis calculator by putting in Google and sepsis calculator, which allows you to use the same uh, algorithm. So it seems to me there's three main management controversies. 
One is as early on sepsis occur in babies with risk factors who appear well at birth. I've already said that that is true. The suspected injury amniotic infection in mother mandate treatment of all newborn babies? And the answer is no. You'll hear me say in a moment if the baby is at least a late preterm baby and well appearing, that's a baby who may need observation but not treatment. And how effective is just watching the baby closely? And how does it compare with the sepsis calculator? In an asymptomatic baby where there are risk factors for sepsis, the risk of sepsis is reduced by 60 to 70 percent, but it is not zero. And I'm really speaking about the term and late preterm babies. It is not zero. This is a, I think, a really cool study uh, done by Wortham with collaborators from the NICHD Research Network. It was a retrospective study of 232 symptomatic and asymptomatic babies, all with positive blood cultures or CSF cultures, born to women who actually had choreaminitis or intraaminic infection. About half of these mothers had both clinical and histologic choreaminitis, the rest had a combination of histologic or clinical choreaminitis. But the lessons were twofold. Virtually every preterm baby with a positive blood culture was symptomatic. But only three quarters of the term babies were symptomatic uh, at birth and five term babies developed symptoms a little bit later on. But the second message I think was important, all infants who died were symptomatic within six hours of birth. That tells you your early physical examination is very important in predicting which babies are likely to have mortality. And finally, I'm gonna summarize the most recent recommendations, I think from December, 2018, so it's about two years ago now, for the American Academy of Pediatrics, Medium Fetus and Newborn, in babies who are more than 35 weeks of station. And the preamble for the recommendation is, first of all, important to realize no method is, a perfect, is perfect. You're never gonna be able to identify every infant who's at risk for early onset sepsis with precision, each strategy has pros and cons, merits and limitations. Each strategy must include uh, measures to monitor the baby and minimize the duration of antibiotic therapy. And wherever you're practicing, you should choose a strategy which best fits your local resources. So the first recommendation was called categorical risk assessment. It's very similar to the old AAP NICE guidelines. And I, I personally don't like it. It used risk factor, factor threshold values to identify a population at increased risk for sepsis. So risk factors can include any newborn infant is ill appearing in which they recommended lab testing and empirical antibiotics or any baby born to mothers with clinical chorimunitis in which they also recommended laboratory testing and empirical antibiotics. And I think, again, as I've already said, if a baby is asymptomatic late preterm or term, that's an erroneous recommendation. If a mother is colonized with group Sheptococcus but received inadequate prophylaxis uh, with a duration of rupture membranes greater than 18 hours or has a gestation age less than 37 weeks, they would recommend laboratory testing but no antibiotics. And finally, they recommend that infants born to mothers with GBS who receive inadequate prophylaxis but without any other risk factors, just undergo observation. And for me, this is a problematic recommendation and I would recommend not following it. That brings us to the sepsis calculator based on data from hundreds of thousands of babies. Uh, and it uses objective data at birth and the evolving condition between six and 12 hours of life to put into the sepsis calculator and get an estimate of the clinical risk for sepsis. So blood culture and enhanced observations are recommended if the incidence comes out to between one per thousand, but is less than three per thousand. And if the risk of sepsis based on the sepsis calculator is greater than three per thousand, they recommend empirical antibiotic therapy. Does the sepsis calculator reduce the antibiotic therapy? No question about it. I think it's had a major impact. And this is a meta-analysis of several studies showing that the use of the sepsis calculator reduces empirical antibiotic therapy. But the sepsis calculator has limitations that are important to know. First of, first of all, 
it, it misses a substantial proportion of infants with early onset sepsis. Not just a little, but a lot. It'll miss 40% of those babies and still recommends treatment of 200 babies uh, for each case of confirmed sepsis. So it's not very precise. Infants with an equivocal presentation and a calculated score of greater than one but less than three require, require a blood culture and serial assessments every four hours. I'm not sure that's enough. I'll talk about serial observations in a second, but blood cultures are, have a poor sensitivity in that setting. And the definition of equivocal presentation is likely to overlap with that of a well-appearing baby who's having a slow physiologic transition, depending on when assessments are made. So serial observation is the alternative. And it's one I like, but it is not easy. Serial observation relies on clinical signs of illness to identify babies with early onset sepsis. Using this approach, regardless of any risk factor, infants who appear ill at birth and those who develop signs that you're concerned about of sepsis are either treated or evaluated by laboratory testing. The gold standard for serial observation, I think, came out of Stanford, and it's this uh, article by Frymore, Moyer, and Bennett, published in Journal of Pediatrics, in 2020, and this is how they approach serial observations. All the postpartum nurses are educated about signs of sepsis and the importance of repeated clinical assessments. They have a hospitalist, who's usually a pediatrician, attend all deliveries and assesses the baby. If they're concerned about sepsis, the baby uh, is then treated. A level two nursery nurse makes assessments every 30 minutes, so much more frequent than every four hours, for the first two hours of life, then every four hours for the first 24 hours, then every eight hours. Well-appearing high-risk infants uh, who are more than 35 weeks gestation are di admitted directly to the postpartum unit for rooming with the mother and the frequency of observation is followed. Now, if you look at the data on serial observations, it just looks very similar to the data on a sepsis calculator. These are data from Bill Bennis's group but using the serial observation approach, the use of ampicillin went down and the use of uh, C-reactive protein as a marker of sepsis also went down. So here's my conclusions. Babies with clinical signs of sepsis that you're concerned about unquestionably need empiric antibiotic therapy. Asymptomatic late preterm and term babies with risk factors for sepsis, including intraamniotic infection, can be observed without empiric therapy, or you can decide to use a sepsis calculator. I like the approach of serial observations. There are groups of preterm babies who are very low risk of infection. For example, those delivered from maternal indications who can be managed without antibiotics, no matter what symptoms they're displaying. And the question is, can select group of ELBW babies be managed without receiving antibiotics? And this is a question that we're now starting as, that we're now studying as part of an NH funded trial of which I'm the principal investigator. So to finish out, the blood culture was negative and because of unremarkable values, the baby was only treated for 48 hours. As baby Kim grew up, he decided to decide to style and color his hair differently and eventually became president of the United States defeating a well-known celebrity. So I showed you a picture of baby Kim. We just put Donald Trump's hair on baby Kim, and he looks like a really welcoming individual. On the other hand, if you take Donald Trump and put him with baby Kim's hair, he looks like a pretty unfriendly individual, which I think he was. So uh, thank you for listening to my lecture. I have enjoyed talking to you. Unfortunately, this is being given at a very early uh, time. Um, and uh, I, but I would be happy to receive email questions or correspondence from you, and I'll, I will, I will try to respond very uh, timely in a very timely fashion. Thank you very much for the invitation, and I enjoyed speaking with you today.